What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I'd like to introduce you to the $600 stopgap gaming PC. This is meant to be an easy to build system that will get you up and running with a powerful base set of hardware that's capable of playing a lot of games, but will also allow you to slap a graphics card in later down the line to get the most gaming performance possible. In this video, I'm going to talk about each of the parts and why I picked them along with full gaming benchmarks. Then next week, I'll put out a full guide on how to assemble this PC and set it up along with additional viewer requested benchmarks. Again, the system isn't going to be a gaming powerhouse out of the gate, but it will be able to play many games at 1080p, 60fps and give you all the functionality of a PC. If you're wanting just the most raw gaming performance right now, then going for a current gen console might be the right choice, but if you're wanting a PC that you can build yourself and upgrade in the future then this may just be the system for you. Now enough with the preamble let's get into the parts that make up this $600 stopgap gaming PC. So the first thing to talk about is the CPU. What I went with is the Ryzen 5 5600G. This is actually what's referred to as an APU which means it's not only has the typical CPU cores but also has GPU cores which will provide video out for the system and allow this PC to game. The 5600G is a 6 core 12 thread CPU running on the the latest Zen 3 architecture that also includes 7 Vega GPU cores that should allow for light gaming and act as a suitable placeholder until you're able to get a hold of a dedicated graphics card. The CPU cores can boost up to 4.4 GHz and the GPU cores run at a static 2 GHz. Now both the CPU and GPU cores can be overclocked and I'll talk about how to do that in the next video, but for the benchmarks I left things at stock settings with no OC to show you what you can get out of the box. 6 CPU cores and 12 threads is great for a gaming PC and is also good for stuff like streaming and even light video editing. The 5600G is pretty powerful and would be great paired with something like a 3060 or 3060 Ti. The CPU comes in at around $260 which for that price is a good value. One other nice thing is that the CPU comes with a free cooler in the box. This is the AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler and while it is basic it gets the job done. This cooler is pretty much just a hunk of aluminum with a fan attached but it looks nice in my opinion. It keeps temps in check and because it is free it means we can save money here to use in other places of the build. For the motherboard this is actually an important place to focus on if you're building a 5600G system. What I went with is the Gigabyte B550M DS3HAC. This board is a great fit for a number of reasons. Most importantly it should be compatible with the 5600G out of the box. Mine had a BIOS from around one year ago and it still booted right up with the 5600G but even if it didn't this board supports BIOS flashback meaning you can update the BIOS without having a CPU installed. I originally was going to use the ASRock B550M Pro 4 but even though I bought it a few weeks ago it didn't have compatibility out of the box and didn't have a BIOS flashback feature meaning I would have needed a different CPU to update it which for me would be fine but for the average PC builder is not an option. The B550M DS3H comes in at around $100 with the AC Wi-Fi version being around $10 over that. For that price you're getting a lot of features like 4 DIMM slots, multiple M.2 slots and good PCI expansion. Along with that there's decent back panel IO and adequate VRM setup and I think it looks pretty good too in my opinion. In terms of video out on the back which we will be using this has an HDMI port and a DVI port for dual monitor support. Ideally I would have got a board with HDMI and display port but again for confirmed compatibility I went with this. Overall this board worked out great for this build and I can highly recommend it. For RAM, this is another area where attention needs to be paid. Ryzen CPUs and especially Ryzen APUs rely heavily on fast RAM to get the most performance possible. The budget was tight on this build but I managed to get a kit that should offer a great value for its price. What I went with is this Team Group T-Force DDR4 RAM which came in a 2x8GB kit. This RAM is rated at 3600MHz CL18 and comes in at only $65 which is a great price. The timings aren't the best but this kit worked great in this build and I personally think it looks good too. 16GB is more than enough for gaming and even enough for streaming and light video editing. If you're wanting to spend more on this build, allocating it to the RAM with a bit better timings may not be a bad idea. With that being said, I have no regrets picking this kit and can highly recommend it. Next up is storage which comes in the form of a single SSD. What I went with is the Western Digital Blue SM550 NVMe SSD. This is a 500GB model and for around $50 it's a great value and fits nicely into the budget. The SM550 is a good mid-range NVMe drive that comes in the ultra-compact M.2 form factor, making installation super simple. 500GB 
Nights is enough for your OS, applications, and a good number of games, but with another open M.2 slot and plenty of SATA ports, this system is capable of being upgraded with a ton of storage in the future, which could come in the form of another SSD or a large mechanical drive for mass storage. There are also 1TB models of the same drive if you're wanting more storage out of the gate, and both models will be linked below. This is normally where I would talk about the graphics card, but again, this is an APU build, so the graphics power is all coming from inside of the CPU itself. Now again, this is Vegas 7 graphics and isn't going to be super powerful, but it will allow you to play a ton of games at 1080p, 60fps, which should hold you off until you're able to get a dedicated graphics card. Now let's talk about the power supply. An APU build like this one is really only going to use 1 to 200 watts, so I really could have went for a low wattage unit, but again, I wanted this build to be upgradable, so I decided to go for a unit that would support a powerful graphics card. What I ended up going with is this EVGA 650BQ. This is a 650 watt, 80 plus bronze power supply that provides plenty of clean power for the current configuration and will also support most any GPU you want to throw in this system. At around $60, this power supply offers a good value for the price and is very reliable. What's also nice is the fact it's semi-modular, meaning you only have to plug in the cables you're going to use, freeing up a lot of space, and all the cables are sleeved black, meaning it will allow for a clean looking build. Finally, let's talk about the case. I wanted something that would provide good airflow, room for expansion, and look nice too. After looking at a bunch of options, I settled on getting this guy, the DIY PC Game Max 3. This is an ATX case with a tempered glass side panel, power supply basement, full mesh front panel, and three included ARGB fans. For the $60 I paid for this case, I think it's pretty awesome. It was easy to build in, and other features like the built-in RGB controller are nice to have. Now yes, this is a micro ATX board in an ATX case, but that's fine, and honestly, I think it looks okay. Overall, for $600, you're getting a powerful set of base hardware that can still game okay and give you the option to upgrade in the future. Now obviously, with any PC build and any budget, there are a ton of ways I could have went, so if there's a different different way you would have spent this budget then let me know in the comments below. Like I said before, this system is super simple to build and I'll have a full build guide on how to put it together, how to install the OS and drivers, and additional viewer requested benchmarks. So now that you have an understanding of this PC and the parts in it, it's now time to talk about performance. I ended up testing a bunch of popular games, but if there's one you'd like to see tested in next week's video then let me know and I will benchmark the most upvoted ones. Going into testing, I honestly wasn't 100% sure what to expect. I haven't used an AMD APU in a while and definitely not one with the CPU horsepower of a 5600G. I started things off by testing Valorant, a popular esports FPS game. I test this at 1080p low settings, which is what many pros play at. Doing this resulted in a 176 FPS average with 1% lows of 55. This was a smooth and enjoyable experience, but no matter how smooth it is, I am still trash at the game. This is plenty of performance in my opinion for casual and even light competitive play. Next up is CSGO, another popular FPS esports game. I tested that 1080p low on Dust 2 in a team deathmatch. Doing this resulted in a 156 FPS average with 1% lows of 47. I was honestly expecting a bit more performance, but overall it was smooth and enjoyable. The next game test is Fortnite, and the settings I went with were playing at 1080p with epic view distance and pretty much everything else at low. I opted into a few Team Rumbles matches, which are kind of worst case scenario, and saw an average of 73 FPS with 1% lows of 37. This was pretty smooth in my opinion, and you could probably turn up a setting or two and still maintain a 60 FPS average. Now let's talk about Overwatch, which I tested at 1080p medium preset with 100% resolution scaling. In a few matches, I averaged 62 FPS with 1% lows of 43. This honestly was less performance than I expected, but overall was smooth and enjoyable. Again, these numbers are with no overclock, so doing a simple GPU overclock could provide some noticeable FPS games. For Rainbow Six Siege, I tested this game at 1080p low using the built-in benchmark and saw an 88 FPS average with 1% lows of 73, which should be enough for casual and light competitive play. In Minecraft, I tested at 1080p with fast graphics and 10 chunk render distance. While flying around in creative mode, I saw a 253 FPS average and never saw the FPS drop below 60, even when blowing up a bunch of TNT. T. For Apex Legends, I first tested at 1080p medium low and saw a 48 FPS average, but dropping down to 1080p low, I saw a much better 57 FPS average which didn't look great but should be enough for casual play. 
The final two games tested were AAA ones, one old and one new. The first is GTA 5, which I tested at 1080p low settings on the first driving mission with Franklin. Doing this resulted in a 67 FPS average with 1% lows of 42. This shows that older AAA titles should work at 1080p on this system. For the final boss of the benchmarks, I tested Borderlands 3, a modern AAA title, at 1080p low. I only saw a 38 FPS average in the built-in benchmark, but dropping the resolution to 720p created a very playable 55 FPS average, which shows that you can play some modern AAA games if you are willing to drop the resolution, settings, or both. Overall, this isn't a gaming powerhouse, but it plays a lot of games decently and gives you a good base for upgrading in the future. Again, let me know what games I should test next with this system and if you're interested to see streaming benchmarks. If you're wanting to see the build guide on this, make sure you have notifications on so you'll be alerted when it goes live. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.